All right. Hi, Science 14 students. Uh, as you know, we have our unit test on Thursday, which covers lessons 1 to 5. Uh, please watch this recording and practice all the questions on it, as that, as that is the, probably the best way to prepare for the unit test. Um, so we'll just get things started here with a little cartoon. First of all, it says Chem is Cool, because that's the unit we're dealing with here, of course. And um, as you can see the cartoon, the one atom is talking to the other, and he says, I lost an electron, and he says, are you positive? And of course, as you know, electrons are negative, so you take one away and you get a positive. Iron. Okay, so let's go on to the next page. Uh, moving along then, let me just get my little handy dandy pointer out here. Uh, so we can see here just a diagram that shows the difference between solids, liquids, and gases. And you can see that both liquids and gases take the shape of the container they're in. And uh, gases take the whole, the shape of the whole container. Liquids would, will just uh, take the shape of the bottom. Um, so you can see the differences then between them, and uh, let's talk about the movement of particles in gases, liquids, and solids. Well, we know that particles move in all three of those, whether it's solids, liquids, or gases. All of them have particles that are moving, but they move different amounts depending on which one we're talking about. Uh, solids move just a little bit. The particles just vibrate a little bit back and forth. Liquids, they move a lot more. They move past each other, the particles that is. And gases, the particles are zipping all over the room right now. So if you're talking about oxygen, for instance, it's just moving from all corners of the room at an incredible rate. So again, gases move faster than liquids, which move faster than solids, that is the particles. OK, so moving along. Here are some important facts about particles, and this is all part of what's called the particle theory of matter. So all matter consists of tiny particles. So that's part of the theory, but the actual part of the theory that we're interested in is the fact that those tiny particles are called atoms. Part B, the particles and mixtures can be easily separated. All particles are in motion and there are spaces between the particles. So all four of those different steps make up the particle theory of matter. And they're important to know. All right, so uh, here we have a diagram. And uh, this is showing different safety symbols that are important to know if you're working in a lab, for instance. Um, these are sometimes called MSDS, which stands for, I think, uh, Material Safety Data Handling System or something like that. So some of the important ones to know are, uh, of course, the flammable symbol, which is fire, the corrosive symbol. So corrosive means that it can eat through skin, for instance, and you can get that idea by looking at this picture. Uh, this here stands for poisonous and infectious materials. And uh, there's other important ones as well, but those are some of the most important ones to know. Now remember this, you never want to mix two chemicals together when you just find them sitting there, especially if their containers are unlabeled and you don't know what they are. You could get an explosion or something else. All right, so uh, we're going to look at some questions now that relate to what we've just gone over. First question says state the four parts that make up the particle theory. These are the four parts here, so you should know them. OK, so I'm not going to go over them right now, but just know these four parts. Compare how particles move in solids, liquids, and gases. Well, we know that all particles and substances move, and the order is going from fastest to slowest. Gases move the fastest, which are faster than liquids, which are faster than solids. Give three examples of safety symbols we've learned about. Flammable stands for fire, corrosive, broken test tube, and poisonous and, and infectious. The symbol is the skull. So we know we want to stay away from that stuff, or at least handle it carefully, right? OK. Awesome, guys. So here we have a diagram of uh, just kind of the organization of matter. And so we can see, of course, that matter is broken into mixtures and pure substances. We'll go into those uh, definitions a little later. But we, what we want to focus on more right now is that pure substances are made up of both elements and compounds. Okay? So 
Pure substances are substances which cannot be separated by physical means. Okay, so you can't take something like a filter and just filter out some sugar, which is an example of a pure substance, and you can't separate the part particles that make up the sugar. Uh, the elements, for instance, uh, you have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen that make up sugar, but you can't just filter them out using a, a filter, right? So pure substances are made of one substance. Now, when we say that they're made of one substance, um, if, since we said that uh, pure substances can be either elements or compounds, if we have sugar, the sugar is made up of different elements, right? It's made up of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but all the sugar is made up of sugar, right? You don't have different particles, and that's what we mean by made of one substance. So pure substances aren't necessarily made of just one element, but they are made of just one substance. So they can be both elements and compounds. And some examples, as you can see here, uh, some examples of elements that are pure substances, copper, gold, anything that's on the periodic table. Some examples of compounds are sugar, salt. So again, they're made up of more than one element. So the definition for a compound is it can be broken down into simpler substances, or at least that's one part of the definition. A compound is made up of more than one element, but it can be broken down into those simpler substances, those elements. Okay, so water is an example of a compound, and it can be broken down into the elements that make it up, which are hydrogen and oxygen. <coughs> On the other hand, elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. <coughs> okay, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the differences between uh, physical properties and chemical properties. Physical properties are properties that can be observed with our senses, so like our eyes, our ears, um, things we can smell. So, for example, luster or shine is one type of uh, physical property of metal, for instance. The size of the substance is a physical property. What are chemical properties? Well, they relate to how substances react with other substances. And so, for example, if you're talking about how metal reacts with water or with oxygen, those are chemical properties. Okay, let's look at a few of the review questions here. 2A, which two types of substances are pure substances? Elements and compounds. And uh, B, which two substances is water made up of? Water is made up of hydrogen and oxygen. And we'll see later that we can separate it into those two substances using electricity. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about the periodic table at this point. The periodic table is amazing, the way it's organized. I believe it's, it's proof of God, actually, the way that uh, he's put together the periodic table in such an amazing way. Uh, the fact that our universe is organized so amazingly, I think, is proof of God. Um, so. The periodic table can be organized by properties and by the mass of the elements. Now, for some reason, this uh, picture of the periodic table is not showing up so well. So if you look on page 8 on the PDF file, you can see a better, <coughs> a better picture here. Uh, basically, it's a picture of the periodic table, and it's just showing that the left side can be separated from the right side, and we kind of have the staircase that's separating the two. Um, so uh, we'll talk later about what's on the left side and what's on the right side. So we talked about the fact that periodic table is organized in two main ways. First of all is by similar properties. So for instance, all the elements in group 1 of the periodic table have similar properties, similar, similar chemical properties. Also, the periodic table is organized according to the mass of elements. Again, remember the word mass is kind of like weight. Now, the further we go, as we move down the periodic table, the heavier elements get. And as we move from left to right, they also get heavier. So again, remember that the columns are known as groups, and the periods, or rather the rows, are known as periods. Remember that all element names start with either, the, either one or two of the letters. They're usually the first letters of the name. So HE is helium, H is hydrogen. That's not always the case. For instance, silver, uh, the symbol is H A G, and you know that, that doesn't sound like silver at all, right? So sometimes they come from the Latin word. <coughs> Excuse
excuse me. Okay, so we said we were going to talk about what's different from the left and the right side. Remember that metals are found on the left side. So, for instance, we have like sodium and um, uh, copper on the left side of the table. On the right side, we have nonmetals like oxygen, fluorine. <coughs> Okay, remember metals have the following traits, and we can see in the picture here. They reflect light easily. They're good conductors of heat and electricity. They're easily shaped, so you can shape them into another form. And most of the time they're solid. Mercury is kind of an, an, an exception there. If you take a mercury thermometer and break it, which you shouldn't because it's poisonous, but uh, you'll get all kind of little balls of uh, liquid. So that's the exception. Most metals are solid. Okay, a few review questions here. 3A, explain how the periodic table is separated into left and right sides. Metals are on the left and nonmetals are on the right. Question B, tell what periods and groups refer to on the table. Periods are the rows and groups are the columns. Question C, the periodic table is organized in two ways. What are they? They're organized, the elements are organized by chemical properties and by the mass of the elements. And part D, as you move from left to right across a row or period in the table, what happens to the elements? Their mass increases or gets larger as you go down or to the right. All right, we're going to talk now about mechanical mixtures and solutions. So both mechanical mixtures and solutions are made up of two substances, two or more. So what's the difference between them? Well, solutions, like this here on the right, appear as if there were one substance. So for example, milk is a solution. So even though there's two or more things that make them up, substances that make them up, they look like one substance. Mechanical mixtures, on the other hand, look like the two or more substances that make them up. So for example, sand, you can see all the different particles in it. All right, so let's talk more about what solutions are. Remember, solutions are made up of two parts, a solute and a solvent. A solution is made up of a solute dissolved in a solvent. OK, let's underline all three of those parts. That's a really important sentence. You should be able to write the sentence out. Solution is made up of a solute dissolved in a solvent. OK. So, if a salt, if a solute such as salt dissolves in water, which is a solvent, together the salt and the water make up a salt water solution. Okay, so here we can see an example. We're adding solute to a solvent and we get a solution. Now, let's talk about soluble and insoluble. Um, when a solute is able to dissolve in a solvent, that solute is soluble in that solvent. And when a solute is not able to dissolve in a solvent, that solute is insoluble in that solvent. So if you think about water, for instance, can you think of an insoluble or a soluble substance in water? Well, maybe salt, right? Salt is soluble in water. On the other hand, oil is insoluble in water. It does not dissolve in water. All right, so some more questions here. What's the difference between mechanical mixtures and solutions? Mechanical mixtures, two or more substances mixed together. You can see the two or more substances that make it up. Solutions, there's two or more substances mixed together, but they appear like one substance. Give an example of each of them. Mechanical mixture, sand, concrete, etc. Solutions, milk, vinegar, they all look like just one substance. All right, question C, define each of the following terms, solute, solvent. Solute is the substance that dissolves into another substance, which is the solvent. The solvent is the substance that dissolves another substance in it, which is the solute. OK, let's think back to the salt water we just talked about. How could you separate the salt from the water in a salt water Solution. Well, a process called distillation lets you separate salt from water. Distillation is basically boiling the water from the salt water and then collecting the salt that's left over. So you can see how that happens here. You've got some salt water here. 
you're boiling the water, a condenser allows the cold water to collect, and you get pure water here, and uh, salt is left behind after the water is boiled off. Okay, do you remember the difference between the terms concentrated and diluted? Well, a concentrated solution has a lot of solute dissolved in the solvent, whereas a diluted solution has only a small amount of solute dissolved in the solvent. Now, what do you think is the best way to dilute a solution? Well, if you add water, that dilutes a solution. And if you want to concentrate a solution, you can boil away the water. So this here shows you the difference between dilute solutions, which are very pale, and concentrated solutions, which are very dark, because they have a lot of solute in them. All right, some more questions here. 5A, which process is used to separate the parts that make up salt water solution? Distillation separates salt and water in salt water. The water is boiled off and the salt is left over. B, compare a concentrated solution to a diluted solution. A concentrated solution has a lot of solute in it, while a diluted solution has only a little. Question C, explain what could be done to a solution to make it more concentrated or more diluted. Adding water can be done to dilute a solution, and boiling off water will concentrate it. OK, let's talk about acids and bases. They're pretty cool, uh, especially if you take some vinegar and baking soda, put them together. What happens? You guys know. It explodes, right? Very cool experiment. Um, I used to uh, take acid and vinegar and put them, or sorry, vinegar and baking soda. I used to take some vinegar, put it in a bottle, put a cork in it, uh, put some wheels on it, um, and then put a little packet of baking soda, and the baking soda would slowly dissolve, and you get the reaction going on between the two, and, and eventually that would uh, cause the cork to go out, and then the, and it would become kind of like a little rocket on wheels. So that was, that was pretty cool. Um, so let's talk about acids and bases. We measure them by their pH. The pH is always from the number 0, I should say 0 to 14. Acids have a low pH. It's less than 7, so all these red numbers here. Bases have a high pH, all these blue numbers. It's between 8 to 14. It's actually not between 8. It's anything over 7. Just over 7 makes it a base. If it's exactly 7, it's neutral. OK, so let's test our knowledge of that. We need to write acid neutral or base beside each one of these pHs. So you can think about that for a while, just what you would write. And then we'll move on. OK, so again, acids are below 7. So 2.3 is an acid, so is 5.6. Anything over 7 is a base, so 10 is a base. If it's 7 exactly, it's neutral. OK, now, remember, uh, when you're using a shampoo, hair is slightly acidic. So we use shampoos that are slightly acidic. Because if we use the basic shampoo, that would neutralize the natural acidity that's in our hair. Most, uh, most soaps, though, are basic. OK. so. Um, vinegar is a weak acid, whereas sulfuric acid is a strong acid. So vinegar might have a pH of, you know, uh, close to 7, since it's a weak acid, whereas sulfuric acid might be, you know, 0, 1, 2, something like that. Most soaps, again, are weak bases. Sodium hydroxide is a strong base, so it's really high pH, maybe 12 to 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, of course, as we talked about already, there's a bang that happens, something amazing that happens when acids and bases combine. They neutralize each other. And this is a good thing, because <coughs> if you have too much acid, you can just add base to get rid of it. <coughs> if you have too much base, you just add acid. Now, our stomachs are naturally acidic. We have HCl or hydrochloric acid in them. But sometimes they become too acidic. Too much stomach acid is what we call heartburn. So what do you think the cure would be for too much acid or heartburn? 
Well, of course, it's a base. We have too much acid, so we add a base. That's going to neutralize that acid and get rid of it. So it makes sense that that base is called antacid. It works against acid. It works to cancel it out. All right. When we talk about indicators, those are substances that change color depending on the pH of the substance they're placed in. So the important thing to remember, guys, is that blue equals base. It doesn't really matter if you have red litmus or blue litmus. Um, if, if you get a result that's blue, you know you have base. And that's easy to remember because base starts with B and blue starts with B. And so if you have pink, you have the opposite of a base, which is an acid, right? Sorry about the barking dog, guys. Um, so this diagram here shows a red litmus with some base dropped on it. And you can see that it's turned blue. I might have to close the door. <laughs> blue litmus paper and a drop of acid, you can see, is pink. So just remember, blue equals base, and you're good. Uh, let's uh, see how we can tell the difference between acids and bases in some other ways. And first, I'm going to quickly get my dog away from the door so she stops barking. Be just back in a minute, guys. Well, she was actually at the uh, windows, so I don't know if I'll be able to stop her from barking, but we're close to the end anyways. So let's uh, see how we tell the difference between acids and bases. Uh, we already know that bases turn any kind of litmus, whether it's red or blue, it, it turns blue. Uh, acids turn pink. Bases are also bitter tasting, and again, we have that B there, B, base, and bitter. Acids turn sour. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, they are sour. Um, and it, it kind of helps you remember because acids are in a lot of um, uh, candies, and candies, of course, are sour. Another thing is that bases feel slippery. And we know that uh, soaps are bases, so that makes sense. All right, let's go over a few questions now. 7A, which litmus test results show you have an acid, which show you have a base? Blue equals base, pink equals acid. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. Name at least one common acid, one common base. Common acids, vinegar, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid. Common bases, sodium hydroxide or baking soda. Um, C, explain why taking antacids are a form of neutralization reaction. Antacids are a base which neutralizes excess stomach acid. D, give two characteristics for an acid and two characteristics for a base. Acids are sour and conduct electricity. Bases are bitter. They also conduct electricity and they're slippery as well. Okay, now remember that uh, corrosion or rusting results from two substances in the air. So both oxygen and water contribute to, to corrosion. And uh, remember the cities that are near an ocean are going to have a lot of corrosion in cars, for instance, because there's salt and water in the air. Now I just noticed something, guys, that uh, some of the stuff I wrote up was meant to be put in what we've already talked over. Um, so I'm just going to scroll over. There's just a little bit left, and I'm sorry. This should have been uh, this should have been put into the rest of the recording, and somehow it didn't get put in or or put into the uh, the file that the recording is based on. Um, just want to talk briefly about what a decomposition reaction is. Now, when compounds decompose, the word decompose means break down, right? So they break down into two or more elements. So, for instance, water is a compound and it breaks down or decomposes into oxygen and hydrogen. And uh, 
electricity will cause that to happen. So you can see that uh, uh, a complex substance is broken into more simple substances. And when decomposition happens, now remember that uh, the substances produced from water are oxygen and hydrogen. <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. Still have a cold, as you can see. Um, all right. Um, now we just want to look at the difference between identifying the number of atoms and the number of elements in a molecule. So this is C6H12O6, which is a, a type of sugar. So how many different elements are in this molecule? Three elements, right? Carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Okay, so basically every time you have another uh, <coughs> letter or combination of letters, that stands for a new element. How many different atoms are there? Well, there's 24 in all. You can see there's uh, six C's plus 12 H's plus six O's. Six, 12, and six adds up to 24. Um, <clears throat> also remember, guys, when you're talking about common chemical names, uh, the name for H2O, the chemical name is dihydrogen oxide, but on the other hand, the common chemical name is water. And some other examples of substances that have uh, common names we should be familiar with. Acetic acid is vinegar, and sodium bicarbonate is the name for baking soda. All right, so guys, we're done. And I want to encourage you guys to watch this recording all the way through and then to practice all the questions on it. That's also really key for you guys doing well on the uh, unit test. Uh, the questions on the unit test are going to be really similar to those here. Uh, so please work hard, and you should do well. Again, remember the unit test is on Thursday. Hope you guys have a great time, uh, great uh, rest of the week. Take care, and God bless. Bye for now.